in the house of the Lord to fellowship. And it's also more special to get to do that on Christmas Day. So, uh, Merry Christmas, anybody who didn't realize today was December 25th. And, uh, we're glad everybody was able to make it out. Uh, very cold weather. We're, we're warming up. I think we're at like a balmy 13. So, uh, heat wave this morning. So, uh, but, but glad everybody could make it out. Uh, just a few announcements to start off the morning. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, uh, there's, there's a handful of items in here. Uh, one thing that's not in there is that there is uh, offering envelopes in the, at the connect wall. Uh, so they're there for anybody who wants those. Um, another thing that's not on here is that there are still a lot of Christmas cards out there. Uh, so if you get time to swing by, I'll look for your name, uh, we'll get those cleaned up. Uh, as far as what our balloon has to offer, as you can see on the back, there is a form on the back of the balloon for any prayer requests, as well as a, a card for visitors to fill out. Uh, we'll encourage you to, 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 to do that if you're visiting with us this morning. Uh, a few items on the inside of our balloon. Um, my wife and I are both are part of some small groups that, that we've started up. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to extend our invite. Uh, it, it says young adults. You guys define not having a good one. We're anybody's welcome, really. Uh, but we're, we, uh, we were a pretty small group, but we're, we've gotten a little bit bigger, so we're kind of splitting it to, to a men's small group and a women's small group, um, which we meet normally on Tuesdays at 6, but it's kind of a flexible thing because we, we used to meet on Mondays at 6 30. So. Uh, but if, if anybody's interested in, in joining that, um, uh, my, my name and my number's in here, as well as my wife's and her number, uh, for anybody who's interested in And, of course, we have a little guy, and, and he always goes, so anybody that's got kids, obviously, welcome to bring this as well. Um, there's no choir or Bible study this Wednesday. Um, women's Bible study is resuming in January. There is still a sign-up sheet on the Connect wall for ministry workers. Uh, we're trying to revamp that list. Uh, maybe do a little bit better job just reaching out to people to let them know uh, before their Sunday comes up. Um, and the only other thing I want to touch on is the, the business meeting. Um, it'll be Sunday, January the 8th. Uh, Troy said that he will make sure that information gets sent out this week uh, about what will be discussed in that meeting. Um, but besides that, I have nothing else, so let's bow our heads and we'll pray this morning to open up service. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we can gather with friends and family, Lord, to, to worship, to fellowship, especially on this Christmas Sunday. And God, I pray as we all leave here this morning that our hearts and minds will be full and focused on you, God, that we can enjoy our day, Lord, while worshiping you. And God, we just thank you and we praise you and love you. Amen. Well, I will continue by saying Merry Christmas, and I'm glad each one of you could be here this morning. We have a special, a special guest with us, the Pulse Family Trio again. We heard them at Easter, and I am so excited that they are here again this morning to worship with us. So please make them feel welcome. If you have any interest in what they do or lessons or anything like that, we can get you that information. But I am so thankful that they are here to help us celebrate the birth of Christ. So let's stand and sing, O come, all ye faithful. I would call you faithful for coming out on Christmas morning. So let's join and sing.
Good morning. How's everyone this morning? I like, as Austin said, we're having a heat wave. Seems that way. The windshield wiper fluid worked on the car. That's a good sign. Right, Graham? Just kidding. <laughs> One of my sons drove in from Charlotte the other day. And the, uh, it wasn't the ice in the sprayers. The, the wiper fluid actually froze in the lines. So things you don't think about. Anyway, I want to welcome everybody this morning, especially the Poles family. Nice to have you with us again. I was going to comment. I'm looking around. I see a lot of, of my faithful flock and a few visitors. And I was going to comment about the Christmas and Easter people. You know, we call them Christers. And kind of as I was sitting thinking, really, you're the only ones that are only here on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> We're going to have to work that out. But we're thrilled to have you guys with us. Um, I wanted to, for prayer service this morning, it is Christmas morning. And it's already been a very uh, awesome morning. If you're like me, I, I still get so excited. We were up late getting things ready. And, and then I can't sleep. I think I got up at about 4.35 o'clock and uh, laid there and finally got out of bed about 5.30. It's, I'm still 10 years old. And then I sat with coffee and waited for the kids to wake up. Um, but it's been a wonderful morning already. And I've had time uh, to also sit and just reflect and think about um, everything this holiday means. Think about um, some of the things that are going on in the world and some of the things that are heavy on our hearts. And, and, and quite honestly, you know, some of the people that aren't here with us this Christmas. Um, but in a great way, because it is Christmas. It is about hope and peace and joy and love and that Christ candle. And because of that, you know, those aren't bad feelings. Those are hopeful feelings. So I just wanted to share that. As we get into the prayer service I read a, a story called The Christmas Surprise, and it basically goes that it was Christmas or near Christmas, and there was a, a nice lady. She was doing her baking and going about making her favorite Christmas cookies. She heard a knock at the door. So she opens the door, and she finds a man. You know, he's dressed uh, um, a little shoddy, and he you know, doesn't look, he's a little disheveled looks and maybe a little impoverished, but he's there and he's asking uh, the woman if she had any work that he could do for her to make a few extra dollars. So she thought for a minute and she said, well, can you paint? He said, yeah, I can paint. I'm actually a pretty good painter. She said, perfect. She said, there's a couple gallons of green paint uh, back here. Here's a paint brush and there's a porch back there that needs to be painted. And she said, if you do a good job, you know, I'll pay you what you're worth. He said, deal. So he goes about his work. She gets busy with their baking. And uh, a little bit of time goes by. She'd kind of forgotten all about it. She hears another knock on the door. And it was him. He'd obviously been painting and working. He had green paint splattered all over him and on his hands. And he said, I'm finished. She said, well, did you do a good job? He said, yes, ma'am, I did a great job, but there's something important you need to know. That wasn't a Porsche, it was a Mercedes. <laughs> I, I knew it wouldn't work, but anyway. The point is, that's quite a Christmas surprise. And the bigger point is, we need to be really careful what we ask for, okay? And especially at Christmas, we need to be reminded, it's a great time to be reminded of the things that we ask for. Not just what we ask for, but what, what are the priorities? What is really important? You know, Christ said in Matthew, he's, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things, then all these things will be added unto you. So it's important that when we pray, that we pray with a sense of priority. And that priority is always what is God's will. 
What is God's will? God's will finds the courage to follow God instead of our own will. To speak God's words instead of our own words. To do God's work instead of what we want to do. So this morning, this Christmas morning, you know, as we're celebrating the hope, the promise of the birth of our Savior. We know that He wants to have a relationship with us. That's the whole point. He wants that relationship with us. And we know that we can pray with Him. That we can be in relationship with Him in prayer. And we can submit to Him. And we can cast our cares on Him because He cares for us. So this morning, whatever it is that's on your mind, whomever you may be thinking about, Give it to God. Give it to Him. Seek Him first. Be still. And know that He is God. Listen. Be silent in that moment. And listen like Christ did when He prayed with His Father. And listen for His will. And then obey. Let's pray. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Emmanuel, God with us, you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, as we pray and lift our concerns to you, remind us that you are the Prince of our peace. You are the God of peace which surpasses all understanding. Lord, when our minds are full of cares and concerns of the world, Calm our hearts and soothe our fears. Lord, give us the peace in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. Lord, just let us approach every part of our lives with, with the assurance that comes from that peace. Lord, we have nothing to fear when you're with us. Let, the, let this Christmas remind our souls and fill our hearts with your loving presence, Lord, and your redeeming power. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this Christmas we consider the full measure and weight of the blessings 
that we've been given. And Lord, the gift of your birth, we humbly give back to you. Lord, we ask your blessings this morning on these tithes and offerings. We pray for your blessings, Lord, as we give faithfully and cheerfully. Lord, not to this thing or to that thing. Not for this reason or that reason. Only in obedience to you. Lord, bless these gifts we humbly give. Remind us this morning. As we envision that first Christmas morning. As you lay in that manger. What your incarnation would ultimately cost you. What you gave. Lord, your very life. So then make us good and faithful stewards of that gift and all the gifts you've given us. Lord, guide our hearts as we seek to use our time, our talent, and our treasure, Lord, according to your will. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. second. That was beautiful. And she's my daughter. Well, you've heard it multiple times already this morning, but Merry Christmas. And it is a little different, I think, for us this year. Um, having Christmas on Sunday. 
I thought, what an amazing, amazing opportunity to be together and to praise God and worship together on the day that we celebrate his birth. So here we are at Christmas morning. And I thought, I mentioned earlier about being up early and reminiscing. I thought I'd think, think for a minute. What's your favorite Christmas memory as a child? Just think about that for a minute, what comes to mind. I won't go into a long story. Mine had to do with uh, a Christmas puppy. It sounds cliche, but it happened. I woke up, uh, I, like I said earlier, I always get up very early, but this particular Christmas, I woke up to something crying in the living room and I snuck down the hall because I was sure it was Rudolph and I didn't want to get caught out of bed by Santa. And when I got there and realized, you know, I'm not joking, I was terrified, but I just had to see what it was. And I peek around the corner thinking I'm gonna see Santa and Rudolph. Instead, I saw a little puppy in a box. My sister's here, she's gonna test, because I think I shrieked, grabbed the puppy and ran into my parents' room and landed in the middle of the bed. Santa brought me a puppy. <laughs> you know, that's how they woke up that morning. But that's probably, you know, any time I think of Christmas, I have so many wonderful Christmas memories from my own childhood, from being a father. Um, we made some more this morning with, with new family that we have. But now I want to ask you to think, what's your favorite Christmas memory in church? What's your favorite Christmas memory that is related to a, a church service or, or something that you did in church. Do you even have one? Yeah. But it, I felt like when I thought of that, it took, a, it took a few more seconds for me to think of one. And that's telling, but it's fair. Doesn't, it doesn't mean anything other than sometimes we put way more priority on all the traditions and the family and all the other things we do. But I, I do remember what came to mind. Um, I grew up going to North Parkersburg and we were still in the old church and they had built a big gym behind the church. A lot of you are from there or have been there. But we used to do the Christmas Eve candlelight service in the gym. And, and I don't know why this particular night, I remember during the candlelight service Maybe as a young kid, it was one of the first times I really felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. Like, like I felt, oh, this is what Christmas is about. Oh, I get it. But I do remember that. It was special. You guys know this. Most of you, if, unless you're visiting, you know this about me already. I tend to geek out. Um, on data and research, but my kids might occasionally refer to it as useless information. Um, if you're old enough to remember, you'd call it a Cliff Clavenism, right? Uh, it's a little known fact. Anyway, this whole thing about Christmas falling on Sunday, obviously if it weren't for leap years, that would happen um, once every seven years. Right, but the leap year makes it a little more challenging. So I looked it up, and the sequence is six years, five years, six years, and then 11 years. Um, now, that's the same for any date falling on any date, except for leap day. Right? So that, you want to write that down if you're a, a geek like me. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. And the good news is... Um, you know, we went 2005, 2011, 2016, and 2022. So if you remember the code, that means we're not doing this again for 11 years. This meeting on Sunday morning. So this is cool. This is special. I was texting with my other pastor friends this morning. It felt like the Super Bowl. It was like, go get them, guys. We're preaching on Christmas Day. It was cool. Everybody's pumped and ready. You know, when I answered my call to ministry and I got started uh, preaching, 
I kind of made a promise to myself um, that I wanted to find a different way, a unique way to, to preach on the big holidays. You know, to find something different. I mean, how many different ways can I tell you about Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem? How many different ways can I tell you about Easter or the Christmas story? It's tough. The truth is that you need to hear those stories over and over and over again. Because the, the simple reason is, first, um, somebody might actually be hearing them for the very first time. Right? As, as a congregant, as a pastor, don't ever assume that anybody's ever heard this story before. So they need to hear it. We need to hear it. And we need to hear it um, Repetitively, because you know what? We still don't get it. <laughs> it's that simple. That's the problem with hearing it over and over and over, sometimes just in one ear and out the other. We don't get it. Nonetheless, I've attempted anyway to try to be unique with my approach on holidays and bring you these very important messages, not changing the message in any way, shape, or form, just to bring it to you in a different way. You might recall two years ago, I did, I did my Christmas sermon um, as a narrative, first person narrative as the star of Bethlehem. I, I asked the guys at Romeo's for ideas. That was John Sine's idea. It was, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of great research. Last year, leading up to Christmas, I did character studies of each main player in the Christmas story to, to understand who they were and what was going on in their lives and more importantly to understand the choice they made what they gave up what it cost them to follow God's will and to follow God's plan instead of their own and if you think about that if they don't do that there's no Christmas think about that so this year we've been Leading up to Christmas, we've been looking through the Old Testament, looking for Christmas, looking for signs of Christmas. And the point of the whole thing is, is simple. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We've been to Genesis. We've talked about the Proto-Evangelium, the very first indication immediately after man's fall and sin. Immediately. God cracks the door open for his redemptive plan, for a promise to, to fix the problem. We went to Numbers and we learned about the prophecy of the star in Bethlehem. We were in 2 Samuel and we talked about the promise to David that it would be his lineage that would be established forever. We spent time with Isaiah. You know, it's, there's all kinds of Christmas in Isaiah. You've got Christ's whole life and ministry in Isaiah. But in Isaiah is where we learn that God himself would come. Emmanuel, God with us. And that God himself would give us a sign. That sign would be a virgin birth. Then we went to Daniel. And Daniel told us when. And it was so complicated that nobody in Judea figured it out. Nobody knew. We learned at Micah the place. Fact is, I could have gone to every single book in the Old Testament and found something about Christmas. Every single book. Because it's all about God's redemptive plan. Last week, all the signs from the Magi in, in Matthew, when we talked about that, how these wise men um, were, were in the Word, how they studied Daniel, how they searched for the signs, how they sought Christ, how they saw the signs and actually followed them. Get that? They didn't just point, hey, check it out. I think maybe everything we read and studied is true. They went, they acted. They followed, and they found the very thing they were searching for. And they found that 
right where they knew it would be, and they found it right when they knew he would be there. Matthew says, when they got there, they fell down, and they worshipped him. All signs from the Magi in Matthew point us this morning to Luke chapter 2. Praise God, it's Christmas. It's Christmas Day. Judgment, redemption, judgment, and hope. The fulfillment of the promise was today. Christ is born. Amen? This morning, let's follow the signs and let's see if we can find Christmas in Bethlehem. If we take a look at Luke chapter 2. Listen, we've been looking at Luke a lot. And when we look at Luke over the last couple of days, we don't need to read it again and again and again and again. So I'm just going to look at verses 4 and 5 this morning. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It reads, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word and bless the ears and the hearts, Lord, that need to hear it. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I apologize for having to use a cough drop, but the weather's been a little weird. I chose to only read those two verses of Scripture this morning because in those two verses, in those two verses, we really get the fulfillment of the main points that we've been talking about over the past few weeks. We have the lineage of David affirmed, and we have Mary with child. It's pretty simple. We have it right there. The lineage of the house, the kingdom, and the throne of David will be established forever from 2 Samuel. And then from Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So we have those two verses. And then the very next verse in verse 6, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Judgment and redemption. Judgment and hope. Hope has arrived. Now, I say we all, but I would say most of us know this Christmas story from Luke. We read it last night. We we didn't read it. Austin read it. (laughs) I won't take credit. Nice job. Austin read it last night for a Christmas Eve service. I read it to my own family an hour after that. They're like, Dad, we just went to church. Why are we reading it again? Well, it's a family tradition that my father started before I can even remember gathering together as family. We still do it every single year. And it's a tradition that I really hope and pray that my kids carry on, probably more than any other. You're here. I hope you, you all heard me. But let's read and refresh ourselves, okay, for just a moment. I want to read on in verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Wouldn't you be? Wouldn't you be? Just out there in the dark doing my job, the angel, the 
and not just the angel, but the glory of God. I think I'd be terrified. I'd be terrified if it happened right here. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Not some, not a few, not a particular group or a particular nation. All people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In this next verse is important as we're talking about signs and looking for Christmas in Bethlehem. The angels say to the shepherds, and this will be the sign to you. Not a sign, the sign. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. So if you're taking notes this morning, mentally or or literally taking notes, I want you to remember or write down the following key words from Luke, okay, from these messages. Savior. Savior, as in sacrifice, as a sacrificial lamb. Manger, not a bed but something that held hay to feed lambs or livestock. Swaddling cloths, shepherds, and flock. It's not a crossword puzzle, there's no test. Okay, this will, this will make sense, so stick with me. I already mentioned I wanted to try to do something a little different. So we've looked at Luke, we've read the scripture. We always start and we always finish with scripture. But I want to make an important disclaimer because purely for context, purely for context, I want to share something with you. I want to share some information from a different source. This information comes from what's called the Mishnah. What's the Mishnah? Anybody know? Carolyn, you held out on me last time I asked a question. And you said, after I answered it, you said you knew it. All right, the Mishnah, okay, Mishnah means repetition. Okay, but the Mishnah is a, is a document that was compiled about 200 A.D. And it's a collection. It's a collection of the earliest authoritative body of the Jewish oral law. An oral tradition. Okay? So what we're talking about here is oral tradition handed down over time. The Mishnah records the views of the rabbinic sages. Those sages were known as the Tanam. And Tanam means teacher. Okay? So again, we're talking about an oral tradition from the Jewish rabbis that was handed down over this time. The Torah in the the Hebrew Bible, the first five books of our Bible and theirs, which we call the the law or the laws of Moses, okay? That's the basis. We know that's the basis of the written down Jewish law. This Mishnah is the basis of the oral law that was handed down. So we have the written law that's scriptural. We have the Mishnah that's oral. It's a supplement, and that's important. It's a supplement, but it's an oral tradition. It's not scriptural, okay? So that's an important, an important disclaimer. It's an important distinction. It is a large, large collection of sayings, arguments, counter-arguments that touch on virtually every aspect of life in the Jewish community during the time of Christ's birth, during the time of Christ's ministry, And it's very importantly uh, applicable to our discussion this morning from Luke. This oral tradition included all of the rules, the oral and unwritten rules around the temple from that time. So we can use the historical aspects of the Mishnah 
only, right, for historical context. That's it. Context to supplement scripture, and that's all. And, and this in no way changes the story. It's adding context. Okay, and I'm talking about it for a long time because, as I said, we start and we finish with the Word of God. We can use other resources if we vet them and we do that. So, with that clarity, I want to share a story with you that is rooted in Scripture and the Mishnah. It's called The Story of Migdal Eder. Anyone ever heard of that? Anybody ever heard of the phrase? Migdal Eder? The story was popular, popularized a long time ago in the 50s, I think, by um, a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. It's based on a lot of information from the Mishnah, as well as biblical scriptures. And it goes like this. The theory that the shelter in which Jesus was born was a place in the northern part of Bethlehem called Migdal Eder. So I'm going to read to you from Genesis. Chapter 35. In this chapter, this reference comes just after it says that Jacob, who at this point is now called Israel, he's, they've just buried Rachel on their way to Bethlehem, but it says Ephra. So Ephra, Ephra, Ephrath, that's Bethlehem. It says right in the scripture, that's Bethlehem. And we need to make a distinction because when we study that and we hear and we see the reference to Ephrath or Ephrathah later, that's a bigger area than just the town of Bethlehem. But it was, they referred to it the same way. It might be like saying, I'm going to Mineral Wells but I'm, gonna, I'm actually in Pettyville. Makes sense? So Ephrathah was a, was a larger area, but it was all Bethlehem. So that's where they're on their way after they've buried Rachel. Then in Genesis 35, chapter 21, it says this. Then Israel, meaning Jacob, renamed Israel. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. Migdal is the Hebrew translation for tower. Eder is the Hebrew word for flock. So basically what this verse says that he went, he journeyed on toward Bethlehem and pitched his tent beyond the tower of the flock. Okay. So we have a reference here to Migdal Eder, the tower of Eder, the tower of flock. The migdal, or tower, well, what's that mean? Towers, these migdals were used uh, as watchtowers. They were built up so that the shepherds had a higher vantage point to look at their sheep and to keep the thieves away. And in the bottom, they were built with a place underneath, and that's where the shepherds would go during lamb, lambing season. That's where the sheep would have their lambs. It was like a birthing room. It was a shelter for newborn lambs. I can't remember who I was talking to the other day, so I apologize if you're here. I was talking about this, and they were telling me how fragile lambs were to raise, that they were difficult to raise, and you had to be very careful with them. So, you know, I imagine the shepherds had these birthing rooms and these spaces for that reason, so they could protect them. Lambs, according to this oral tradition, these were lambs that were later used for sacrifice at the temple. And we'll come back to that. There's speculation in the Mishnah that Bethlehem, think about this, Bethlehem's only five miles south of Jerusalem, on the road to Jerusalem. Being such they became known as the place to procure your sheep for the sacrifice at the temple. It was on the way. It was convenient. There's also speculation that because of that notoriety and their proximity to the temple, over time, certain sheep in Bethlehem and certain shepherds in Bethlehem were considered special. They were even called 
temple sheep and temple shepherds. That oral tradition relative to those certain shepherds at Migdal Eater, or again, the tower of the flock. The temple sheep and the temple shepherds, they even go on to use that to explain why in Luke, when we read the story, why the heralding angels gave the sign that the baby would be wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The shepherds seemed to know exactly where to look. The angels didn't tell them where to go. They said, this is the sign. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. But per the tradition, Mishnah it said that these shepherds took great care, again, right, of the temple sheep, these lambs to keep them safe, to keep them pure for sale and use as sacrifice in the temple. That in this place beneath these watchtowers, these migdals, where the lambs were born, and where these lambs were fed from a feeding crib, from a manger. It said that they would go so far as even to wrap these lambs in swaddling cloths to protect them. So maybe that means something when now when we hear the angel's message. So now let's look at Micah. Let's go back to the word. Well, last week in that Christmas, you know, we read, we studied Micah 5 too, right? He says, but to you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, again, Bethlehem, you larger area, Bethlehem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Pretty straightforward. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 8 where Micah is being prophetic about the future of Israel. And listen to what he says in verse 8, chapter 4. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. The prophet Micah foretold that Bethlehem would be the place of the Messiah's birth in, in 5.2. And then specifically mentions Migdal Eder, or the Tower of the Flock, now figuratively representing all the people of Judah. To you it shall come. The watchtower of the flock, the city of David, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. The city of David, the shepherd king. Remember, David was a shepherd before he was a king. The kingdom, the house, and the throne of David will be established forever. Remember from Samuel, 2 Samuel. And now from Micah, we're told that the watchtower of the flock... In Bethlehem, all of Judah will be restored by the Messiah. The Tower of the Flock. It's quite a story, isn't it? It's some interesting context. Firmly rooted in scripture and oral tradition. I don't think we've taken anything away from the gospel account at all. We've only perhaps added context and, and that's all it is. Oral tradition. Truth? Truth? I have no idea. I have no idea. Certainly, at least a new and different perspective about Bethlehem. A new and different perspective from historical tradition about the shepherds. And maybe even a deeper and more symbolic meaning of where exactly the Messiah would arrive. But here's what I know to be 100% true. In the Old Testament, Ephrath of Bethlehem, you could buy a, a sheep for a blood sacrifice at the temple that was only good for one year.
in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, just as it was promised, just as it was foretold, in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, God became man. Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God, the sacrificial Lamb, Savior, came as a blood sacrifice for all people. Judgment and redemption. Judgment and hope. Hope has arrived. God's promise has been fulfilled. The story of Magdal Eater, the Tower of the Flock, it would certainly be appropriate, wouldn't it? For the Messiah to be born in the very same place where these sacrificial lambs were born. But listen, whether, whether the actual location of his birth was an indoor animal shelter on the bottom level of a, a house or a separate barn or a cave in the field or even this lower level of a watchtower of a migdal. The Bible is clear. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, was born in a humble setting as a baby in the town of Bethlehem. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All of that begins in Bethlehem. All of that begins with Christmas. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this Christmas day, we thank you, Lord, for your message. We thank you for simply being together in love and fellowship as we celebrate your birth, as we praise you and worship you. Jesus, your name is still wonderful, still counselor, still the mighty God, still the everlasting Father and still the Prince of Peace. Lord, as your obedient children, we pray. We pray for a refreshment. We pray for a fresh feeling, a new awareness, Lord, of who you are. We choose, Lord, we choose by faith to make your good news of great joy a reality in our own lives. We do that so that others can see you in us, so that others can see your love and your light through our lives, pointing all signs to you this Christmas. But we know one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And we also know that peace on earth and goodwill goodwill to men, Lord, it begins with us. It can only come when our hearts find peace with you. You're still our joy. You're still our peace. And you are no longer a baby in a manger. You are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And this morning, we celebrate you as Lord, this Christmas day and always. Lord, we praise you. And we do everything we do. In your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor.
talk I'm looking forward to the sermon in Luke for four weeks, and you put quite a spin on it. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's all stand as we close and say, Joy to the world. We're going to sing the first and the fourth verse. And our prayer is obviously... Just remember to, to be a witness of what today's really about. Um, I appreciate all of you that are here and to those that are watching online. I know it's uh, the weather's bad, and uh, I hope uh, that you enjoyed the message. I'm grateful that you're joining us any way that you can. So I just want to pray with you one more time with these words. Let's pray. Lord, this Christmas day, God grants you the light of Christmas, which is faith, the warmth of Christmas, which is purity, the righteousness of Christmas, which is justice, the belief in Christmas, which is truth, and the all of Christmas, which is Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen.